Patriarchal Monastery of the Holy Trinity on the island of Kalki. He is the former Chief Secretary of the Holy Synod, the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And his subject is going to be one of the premises of the conference, and that is the Berlin Wall of Religious Freedom. That is Halki. Metropolitan Halki the Forest. Your Eminences, Your Excellencies, dear Archons, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and joy for me to have this opportunity to participate in a conference of such a high level. And I would like to express my sincere thanks to the organizers, the Archons of America. My gratitude is especially fervent because my topic is an issue very crucial to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, namely the reopening of the sacred theological school of Halki. Halki, where I have the honor to serve as abbot over the last two years. Much has been written and said about the significance and history of Halki theological school. Thus, I find it quite difficult to find something to say to you which has not already been emphasized and which the audience will not strive to learn something new. Uh, let us briefly consider some elementary historical facts about the school. Uh, it was founded in the year 1844 by Patriarch Germanos IV. The current structure was designed by the architect Pericles Fotiades and erected thanks to a gift from our grand benefactor, Pavlos Skilicis Stefanovic, in the year 1896. Since its establishment to this day, graduates of the school have included ecumenical patriarchs Joachim IV, Neophytos VIII, Anthimos VII, Constantine V, Germanos the fifth, Gregorius the seventh, Constantine the sixth, Benjamin, Maximus, Athenagoras, whom you all know, Demetrius, and of course our patriarch Bartholomew. It has also provided to the Orthodox Church patriarchs of Alexandria, like Nicholas VI and Parthenius III, patriarchs of Antioch, Alexander III and Elias IV, archbishops of Athens, Germanos II, Chrysanthos, Spiridon, and Chrysostomos the second, and the last is Archbishop Christophoros of Albania. Just uh, I named only uh, the first hierarchs while omitting all the rest of the bishops and clergymen graduates of our school. The government has closed down the school in the year 1971. Since then, it is active up to today as a monastery, the monastery of the Holy Trinity. 
It is no easy matter for someone to bear the responsibility for the administration of a place which has hosted numerous personalities of the church and our nation of such immense spiritual standing and far-reaching influence. Indeed, one cannot accept this responsibility unless one is profoundly schooled in the history until one is unworthily permitted in the tradition if one is not spiritually nourished by the ethos of the school. Thus, having endeavored during the tenure of my ministry at the Fanar and particularly close to Patriarch Bartholomew to receive some taste of the spirit of Halki, I can dare to envision its future. For we have all spoken about everything except the future of Halki. Since we strive and endeavor to achieve the reopening of the school in light of injustice that has occurred by the state against our people and our patriarchate, it could be prudent to offer some reflections about how we imagine its future. From the outset, I wish to underline that we do not simply fantasize about this future. In fact, we are diligently and carefully preparing for this. Within these reflections, the benchmark is raised very high, precisely because of the well-known history and importance of the school, but also due to the widespread publicity about the need for its reopening, thanks to the tireless and persistent efforts of Patriarch Bartholomew, supported by our dioceses outside Turkey, like the United States, Germany, and of course, thanks to our Archons of America. First of all, the standard of education cannot but be at university level not just theoretically, but realistically. That is to say, at the very essence of the knowledge that is provided. Moreover, I might dare to claim that the level of the school must be independent of the status of recognition by the Ministry of Education in Turkey. For example, it might be possible for reasons of adaptation to the existing legislation that the Ministry of Education will not offer university accreditation to our school. Should this be the case, I believe that uh, we should insist on having such a level of education in place that would correspond to the universities to the, standards, uh, to the standards and meet the expectations of all European and American universities in order that our degrees would be certified by various institutions of higher learning throughout the world. In this way, not only will our school achieve the level it deserves, but its recognition will also be secured by universities worldwide, while at the same time, the prevailing legislation in Turkey will not be violated. Naturally, the ideal situation would be for the Turkish authorities not to find themselves once again in the difficult position of being the only country internationally which does not recognize an existing reality. Continuing to think aloud, I feel that beyond this highest standard of excellence, our school is further obliged to move on a global level, responding not only to the demands of our times 
and the contemporary needs of the ecumenical patriarchy, but even to the expectations of our metropolises throughout the world, as well as of other Orthodox churches and Christian confessions like Roman Catholic Church and Evangelical Protestant churches. In this regard, a very critical factor is the language in which classes will be taught. Since in our age, the English language prevails in all domains, I believe that it would be wise for English to serve as one of the languages for instruction alongside Greek and, of course, Turkish. This would immediately launch the school onto the international sphere of universities worldwide and permit an uncomplicated exchange of faculty and students from other universities, as well as a mutual cooperation with institutions of higher learning in general. It will undoubtedly not be easy to achieve for our students a level of linguistic knowledge that would allow them to attend classes in English. But it is also not an impossible feat since this is widely acceptable in many universities of the world, including our country, Turkey. For better results, it would be beneficial prior to the commencement of the formal coursework to include a preparatory year, year for teaching classes in Greek and English language alongside introductory classes in theology. Indeed, classes in the Greek language are mandatory, not only for non-Greek prospective students, but also for all those unfamiliar with the ecclesiastical Greek and, of course, the polytonic system. Nevertheless, there would be another purpose for establishing an additional preparatory year of studies. First, year preparatory as a test for students to adapt to the specific and demanding environment of the school. Second, as a confirmation of the priestly vocation of the young candidate about to commence theological studies. And thirdly, as an extension of the time spent by the young students in the environment of our school, where they would have greater opportunity to be imbued with the spirit and ethos of the ecumenical patriarchy. In speaking about students, I must observe that the space of the existing building complex is fixed for 25 students annually. This means that if the idea regarding a five-year program ultimately comes into effect, means one preparatory year plus four years of studies, the total number of students could reach about 125, which number is accommodated by the potential of the building as well as the history of the school since there were never more students than this. It is logical to imagine that when we receive permission to reopen the school, it will be fully open to registration by students from abroad, since the Greek population in Turkey, for purely statistical reasons, is unable to provide us with students. This, too, will be nothing new, since overseas students were permitted to enroll in the past. We may expect the same with regard to teaching staff in order for the school to be able always to maintain a high level of teaching with faculty possessing a doctoral degree at the very least. 
Given the ecumenical nature of our school, students will be invited for en enrollment not only from the eparchies of the ecumenical throne throughout the world, but also from all Orthodox churches and other sister churches such as the Roman Catholic, the Anglican, etc. Just again as occurred in the past. We must, however, anticipate a specific program of studies for the non-Orthodox students, which could also be of briefer duration, with particular emphasis on Orthodox theology, since the remaining common aspects of Christian theology can be learned in their respective theological schools. Beyond the common classes taught in every theological school, our school must give distinctive attention to the following areas which constitute significant branches in the activity and ministry of the Ecumenical Patriarchy. First, the place and the role of the Ecumenical Patriarchy within the Orthodox Church and the Christian world in general. Second, the theological dialogues and generally the theology and history of the ecumenical movement. Thirdly, the theological vision with regard to the protection of the environment and ecological matters, more broadly, as these have been cultivated over many years. And last, the interfaith initiatives of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and specifically the academic dialogues with Islam and Judaism. However, in order for all these to come uh, to fruition in the most efficient manner, we must be concerned with the necessary material and practical infrastructure. The library, you see the library of our school. The library is the laboratory of every educational institution and must be fully equipped and organized in exemplary fashion to meet contemporary standards. In practical terms, this includes not only the processing, its collection, its collection and recording its catalog, but also its connection through the internet with libraries of other universities. This is also the modern philosophy of library planning, the new concept, since no university can of its own assemble the world's bibliography in its entirety. The complete digitalization of the library will be the next stage. And this digitalization is already in process and for which we are now seeking sponsors. Second, the radical restoration of the building complex. There are many aspects to this. First is the creation of single rooms for students and faculty. Second, is the complete refurbishing of the building in terms of electrical and technical systems. Third, is the updating of internal communications and internet networks. And fourth, the establishment of a conference center. The conference center with adequate seating and appropriate resources as a venue for events and international conferences, which the school would organize or host. Of course, all of this will occur with the employment of architects of international acclaim and recognized experience in their respective field in order to secure complete respect for the historical character of the edifice and surrounding space. The work will take place with the latest 
means offered by modern architecture and technology in general. So that the school will be lacking in nothing as an exceptionally equipped and superbly organized educational center of our time. We have already acquired a relevant study from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. We have prepared a budget for the projects. All that remains in the commencement of the fundraising to raise the necessary financial resources through an invitation by our Patriarch and the Holy and Sacred Synod to all the Greek organizations and individuals throughout the world, the Archons included. Here you can see the new plan, the new plan of the new Halki. This is the vision for our future. You can see that the conference center is not a new building which is over the surface of the surrounding, but it is under the air. And this because we are very sensitive with the environment, with the trees around, and we don't want to spoil this beauty. Under the earth will be the new conference center and the new library of the school. Here you can see the entrance of the conference center and the library. The new concept for the surrounding of the school this is the interior of the new library. This is the entrance of the new conference center. And this is an example of a new room, single room with all facilities for the faculty and the students. I have left the most important matter for last, namely, the spiritual concern for and guidance of our students. All the details I have mentioned thus far are surely important and necessary, but they may also be found elsewhere. That which cannot be found elsewhere is what always rendered our school unique and distinctive. I am referring to the monastic character of the daily routine, as well as the spiritual life of the seminarians' students. The students who live as novice brothers of the Holy Trinity Monastery, within which they will also be studying at the theological school. The daily liturgical services, participation at the counter stalls, observance at the holy altar, the practice of preaching, common meals with readings, all of these will, just in the, as in the past, comprise the spiritual routine where the future resources of the church will be nurtured beneath the loving protection of Panagia Pavsolipi, the precious icon of the Theotokos who puts an end to all sorrow. I'm sorry, there is a problem with the presentation. Not all pictures are there. There should be a continuation after this picture. The frequent presence of the patriarch, the hierarchs of the throne, and the professors, as well as the first-hand atten attendance of the ecclesiastical life and activity of our patriarchate will familiarize students with the daily life and spirit of the Mother Church. Our students will learn to dialogue with all people of goodwill, with Christians of every confession, with people of every faith and national background. In order, however, to achieve this, they must be well versed in Orthodox theology and spirituality. 
For if someone wishes to enter into dialogue with another, whoever this other may be, unless one is knowledgeable and aware of their own theology, their own culture, and their own language, then only one of two consequences are possible. Either one will become confused due an inability to respond to the demands of this dialogue, or else one will transform this inability into an ideology becoming over-conservative, nationalistic, reactionary, and in every sense, marginal. Yet, when one has a strong sense and self-awareness and is educated in orthodox theology and spirituality, then the dialogue with the other is an opportunity for enrichment, is an opportunity for orthodox witness and practical demonstration of Christian love toward all people. The reopening of our school, theological school of Halki, is important not only for the ecumenical patriarchate, but for all Christianity, as well as Islam and Turkey. Let me explain this. The graduates of our school will be bearers of the spirit of our patriarchate, which is a spirit of dialogue, cooperation, peace, and love.